right, I'm going to pop my eyes out onto my cheeks. And she's like that. She's good and ready just to pop them onto her cheeks. It took me all my time to calm her down again and then start singing to her again, Streets of London. Would you say she was the most dangerous female inmate you came across? Yeah. Yeah, ever. Dave went like that to look at his watch. Weren't there. She'd ate it. She ate the watch. She went straight for my head with this plastic knife. And she was so strong with drugs. Even I'm a big bloke and I was strong at the time. And I was trying to hold her and I couldn't hold her. One of the young officers who joined just after me, she bent down too near her and she grabbed her hair. But what she did was, she twisted it and twisted it and twisted it. She would not let go of her hair. And then her head started bleeding. She was screaming, oh. officer. Blood was running down her face. And that was my first encounter, that. She said, right, I'm going to stitch her arm. But because she's put me through this at this time on a night, she's only going to get half her arm. She told the prisoner, we've run out of anaesthetic, so we can do half your arm, but you'll have to suffer the other half. Oh, my God. It was, she was absolutely screaming, and all that nurse kept doing was smiling at me. Oh, yeah. sadistic. But I couldn't report it. But, unfortunately, I was fast asleep and snoring on my back, and this rat went straight down into my belly. She went, look. And she showed me a belly like that. She went, look, can you see it running? And all I want is a knife. Can you give me a knife and I'll cut this out and get rid of it out at window? And if I'd have given her a knife, she would have done, seriously. Let that rat go to sleep and you have a little sleep and I'll get medical care to you. Oh, right, oh, lovely, Mr. Graham. Thank you very much. Come on, you. She's like that and she's... <laughs> I'm like, crikey. Uh, she hung herself from taps on a sink. And she would only, at that time, maybe 20. She would only from the young. Sink, from the sink yeah. tips. I cut a woman down nine times in an hour. Nine, nine times. times? But I just lost it. I just couldn't comprehend what was happening with things. I just could not get my head around things. Were your family worried about you back then? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it was a time when, you know, I'd lost my mum. And she was a big piece. But I'd lost her. It hadn't been for my wife. I don't know. I don't know. Because it was, it was, they'd push me that far. All right, so I'm here with Kevin. He's done eight years, approximately, in the prison service. All of our prison service stories, people, the public are fascinated by them. And Kevin is really good at telling them, as you're about to see. Kevin's working on his book. We're going to help him promote that when it's out there. Uh, so keep an eye on that. And also, we're going to start out with Kevin telling us a story about one of the most dangerous female prisoners he encountered called Rachel Agar. So first off, a huge thank you for coming on, Kevin. Welcome. And what was your interaction with Rachel Agar? Well, it started in a very precarious way on her health care at uh, Newall Prison in West Yorkshire. Um, she was a very, well, I should say scary. She was a very, very scary woman. A big woman. Um, I'd say five foot ten by about five foot ten wide. You know, huge. But the girl uh, had no tolerance for anything. She... She would go for violence rather than anything else. But the first encounter I had with her when I opened the hatch, she just was there with the biggest blue eyes you've ever seen, all red and cracked. And, uh, you know, at the time, it sort of took me by uh, shock. And she said, who are you? What's your name? I said, my name's Mr. Graham. And hairs were up on the back of my neck. And uh, But you can't let them see that. You can't let them see weakness. And every half an hour, on the half an hour as though she had a watch, she'd buzz buzz her for another cigarette. And as day went on, we got talking and, you know, but I'd been warned that if she sort of took a liking to you, be very careful. She'll want you near a hatch. She'll either grab for your throat or your hair or whatever. So I was being very careful, you know. 
And as time moved on to, you know, get to a point with Rachel, she became to like like me in a way that she didn't like anybody else. And there were only me could speak to her in a way to calm her because nobody else were interested, to be honest. But she knew I was interested in her. What was she getting upset over? Sean, that girl could get upset about shutting her door too loud. Honestly, she was one difficult person. Um, like one incident, I were on the segregation unit one day, had been sent for because Rachel was carrying on. She was uh, absolutely smashing up and had been told that she'd said she wanted Mr. Graham. Otherwise, she would not pack in. So Mr. Graham went over there, asked her what the problem was. She said, I want to see you more than these. I don't like these. They don't like me, so why should I like them? I said, Rachel, you're in a prison, my love. We're not in an hotel. Come on. Yeah, but you were always nice to me. She said, I want you to sing with me. Yeah, this is right. And this is a prison officer. Actually stood at a door singing um, Streets of London. <laughs> yeah. And that is true, true as I sit here. And an SO walked on, who was a friend of mine, who were my SO in security. Great guy, but very much on the book. He didn't tolerate anything like that. And he looked at him and went, what are you doing there? So I went, I'm just with Rachel calming her down, uh, Mr. So-and-so. And I'm, you know, singing. He went, well, I wouldn't sing no to her. And straight away, that was it. She just went red. It was like, right, I'm going to pop my eyes out onto my cheeks. So I went, Rachel, you're not popping them eyes out. Otherwise, Kevin's going. And she, well, I didn't call Kevin. Mr. Graham's going. And she went, I'm going to, and she's like that. She's good and ready just to pop them onto her cheeks. So he gone, at this SO. I'm there then left with her, like in this mood. It took me all my time to calm her down again and then start singing to her again, Streets of London. <laughs> and I don't think I'd ever go through to final on to, what they call it, Britain's Got Talent, no <laughs> I'm not that good, but, you know, it was just that she liked that sort of thing, but that's the kind of person she was. And the same person one day had been given a chicken breast, but the bone wasn't removed. So what did she do? She removed the bone, sharpened it in the cell, and tried to cut a breast off. That's how Rachel was. Then we had to take her to hospital for attention. Five of us had to go with her because she was such a violent person. Then she started wanting to fight at the hospital. So we rolled in right waiting room in uh, A&E, you know, fine. I was on top of her. I went to grab her and her arms were that damaged with self-harming. They were like tissue paper of skin. My thumb went straight in her arm. So I've got, I'm up to my eyeballs in blood and what have you. And we're all rolling round, you know. And we have to then cuff her and get her under control. And that's just for her just to see medical attention for something she's done to herself. What, but that's how she was. Well, what was Rachel in for in the first place? Just violent assaults and um, bad behaviour in public. Uh, like she'd stand in a supermarket and just stand and drink a bottle of vodka. And then obviously somebody would come up to a security man or whatever. And she'd just say, you come near me and I'll shove this in your throat. That's how she was. she was. And I would believe she would have done it. One of the stories she told me once, which I was very interested in, um, there were a, I think I'm sure everybody out there will remember, a woman called Nurse Allett who killed babies. The angel of death. Yes, mm. that's the one. She was in Rampton and Rachel was in Rampton and Rachel hated anyone who had anything to do with kids, like, you know, harming them or whatever. So she waited while there were sort of lulling officers in the association room and attacked her. And I said, well, I'm Rachel. She said, I was two seconds off killing a Mr. Graham. But just like that's how she talked. So you were like a really scary person, you know, even though she's a woman and obviously men are physically bigger than women, not cleverer, but they are physically bigger. So, you know, but you do get scared with even something like that. And... Um, I said, why you what? She went, yeah, she said, but they beat me. I said, what? She said, officers came in and beat me off her. She said, I had her where she was just going. I could see she was going. I had a bit of throat. I was like, oh, right. But that's what kind of person she was. And you couldn't leave Rachel in a situation where, you know, you, you, you trusted her. Although that did happen with me once. 
and that were a very that were a very trying one with that because I was on segregation, and I'd gone to look after Seg while there were an incident in prison. Rachel was at exercise yard. Now exercise yard was sort of where I am now. Say I'm in the office. You looked up that way, and that was the exercise yard. So you could see it out of your office door. So I put your head round door, and you could see. And she brung buzzer. So I shouted up to her, Rachel, what do you want? I said, you know I'm busy, I'm doing paperwork. And this is just how she said it. She went, I need a shit. <laughs> so I, I said, Rachel, Rachel, I can't do nothing about it. I'm on my own here. You know, I said, come on. She went, I need a shit. <laughs> and if you don't let me out for a shit, I'm going to shit here in this yard. So I went up to her and I thought, Jesus. This is going to be a bit. So I said, Rachel, you know me. I'd help you as much as I can. And I have done it past. I said, but if I help you, you don't turn on me. And she went, Mr. Graham, you know I like you, but I want a shit. <laughs> so I said, right, I'm going to let you out, but I want you straight in that room. Now, nah, I shouldn't have been opening that door, to be honest. I know. I shouldn't have done, but it was alternative. Do I help here? Do I try and help the prisoner get back to the room and do what she should do normally? Or do I let her disgrace herself by squatting in there? And I couldn't get anybody else to help me. I unlocked gate. She run down that corridor. I've never known it was like an elephant. Boom, 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 boom. And when she got to the cell, she slammed the door. I thought it would come off hinges. And then all I heard was this brass band, you know, which were obviously ablutions. And... Uh, <laughs> I just said, yeah, I think you did need to go, Rachel. And like, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, she uh, that was another incident. But that just showed that you could actually put a bit of confidence into her. And that's what – she needed a bit of that, you know. She was not shown any compassion by anyone. What other things did she do to the guards? Because you said she would drag – she would get through the hatch and drag their hair. Well, one particular day we had problems with her and we had to go into the uh, cell to her. And the SO at the time is is dead now, God bless him. Uh, great guy. And when we were having this incident with her, we'd all got finished and we'd calmed her down. We got out at cell, slammed door, and Dave went like that to look at his watch to mark down what time was. His watch were gone. She took watch. So when we went back in to search for watch, weren't there. She'd ate it. She ate the watch. So the next day, when Dave were walking past segregation, she shouted, Mr. Pratt! Mr. Pratt! So he shouted, what, Rachel? So she went, have you got rat time on you? <laughs> <laughs> she knew that she'd had his watch, and he knew that it was her, like, you know, and he just sort of gave her a, a bit of a signal, and that one he'd like, you know, but she had, a, she had one over on him that time. Did he get the watch back? Uh, no. <laughs> that never come back to his possession. No. The replaces watches don't come back for uh, him. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know where that ever ended up, but <laughs> he certainly didn't come back in my knowledge. No. So did she attack any other prisoners or guards that you, you knew of? <laughs> she, not so much as, a, as in attacked in a bad way, but physically sort of told them that she was going to do. Had they pushed it any further, you know, their luck. Because she, she was a person who would wait. Uh, she would wait an opportunity. And there'd be that opportunity and she would attack then. She was a she wanted very sort of, she'd come across very slow and very, you know, wanting. But she had, she were all there in some respects. And that was one of them. She'd calculate when to go. And, and I presume she was in a cell on her own. Oh, yeah. Segregation. Never, ever mixed her never did she ever leave segregation no, Seg no. She, she, she were on segregation or hospital wing but if she were on hospital wing she wouldn't be allowed out on association with the rest of them she'd be put in you know uh, association on her own and there'd be more officers up there to watch her did the rest of them express fear of her oh yeah everybody they were all scared of her all women were scared of Rachel Agar if, if uh, she were to be out like when she never had visits, but if we had to walk her to healthcare and anything like that, you could see them all looking and backing off. And if she just looked at them, they'd cower 
Oh, she was. She won a very, very, very tasty customer one, Rachel. Would you say she was the most dangerous female inmate you came across? Yeah. Yeah, ever. As a, in respect of violence, she was the most dangerous. The others were uh, sort of psychologically, uh, they were more uh, tastier than her in that respect, you know, but she was the violent one, were Rachel. All right, we're going to get to them. All right, so why on earth did you join the prison service, Kevin? Right, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why? Uh, what he wanted, it all started off as a relative who never had done anything wrong in his life, been a great guy all his life, but got sucked into a fraud. But with technology these days, he should have made a stop to it, but he never did. He let it run along because he, he felt it'd be more unpopular if he had it done. And then when it came out... He obviously suffered consequences with a few more that got time. And I couldn't believe it, me, that this guy got time. You know, he'd never, he'd, he'd bend down and pick a, you know, a five pence off floor for an old woman and give it back, you know, really nice chap. Um, so when he went in and I used to go visit him, tales he used to tell me about, you know, how many bullies there were. And, you know, he'd say him over there, like, you know, he'd say, well, leave folk alone, he's always carrying on at you and you know I don't ever say oh but he's always wanting to say this to me or do that with me or put me on to bad jobs and so I thought you know what if if I were to join this service is one man who ain't going to bully people or who's going to show compassion am I going to sort of make an headway in and make some kind of impression so that's what drove me to join in first place because I wanted to be someone who all right, you know, I agree with that when people have done crimes and that, they, they go inside, then, yeah, they, they've got to be kept in custody and, you know, reasonable and everything, but not bullied, which I witnessed a lot when I was there, you know, and I couldn't stop it, to be honest. I could not get to the bottom of it. I couldn't stop it. And that was what motivated me to join, Sean, in first place. Was that a big change of career path for you? Um. Well, yeah, it was really because I'd done 10 years um, as a crematorium attendant at Pontefract. So I'd been there like all through a lot of harsh winters and doing a lot of work that a lot of people would never even consider. What's the well, yeah. jobs that you do as a crematorium? <clears throat> well, obviously cremate bodies, you know. Uh, most I've ever done in one day is 17. Uh, yeah, it was crazy in them days. It was now... I think they only allow them to do about six or seven a day, if that. But then it was 17, it was round about Christmas time, and all undertakers were trying to, you know, alleviate the back rooms and, you know, so they were trying to get them squashed in. And I was stuck there till about eight o'clock at night on my own, you know, cremating. That's fascinating, Kevin. What, why did you choose that profession? Because that's very unusual. Well, again, Sean, um, when I joined Guards in 79... I thought that was going to be my career for at least 22 years. When you say the guards, what do you mean? Cold stream guards, you know, um, for household regiments. Now, when I joined, what I never spoke about was that I'd been born with an art murmur. Uh, because up to being about 10, it really did affect me. But after that, this um, specialist I used to see, Dr Livingston, he said that the skin had grown over it now and, you know, yes, the murmur's still there, which is still there now, but it's not affecting you like it was. Are you still tired? Are you still... No, no, I feel great now. I used to play football. I was in football teams. Um, fine. So when I joined up, I never thought, well, I'm not going to mention all that because I'm going to end up in, you know. But then what I didn't realise, I'm only, I'm only 18 then. I'm only a young lad. I've never been to London in my life. I ended up going down there on train to join up in barracks down London. You know, I'd never seen big city. So obviously I didn't realise consequences afterwards when they found it out from my medical records and then I were medically discharged. So that really upset me that. I never got over that. And then when I came home, Thatcher were in charge at the time, which I'll not go into that one because I'm sure that would get us nowhere. But she was in charge, so jobs were very small in, in North. She was killing communities. I had a friend who worked at Railway. Uh, she was at officers, a really lovely woman. 
And um, I was telling her, I said, I can't get a job, you know, I just want a job. She said, don't worry about it. We've just had interviews, like, you know. She said, I'll get you a job. Don't worry about this, Kevin. Anyway, sure enough, she did. She got me this job on railway, but the, it was absolute rubbish. And this job came up in the cemeteries. I thought, right, I'm away, I'm away. So I went to that job and I got it, luckily enough, at the time. And then two years after I'd been in cemeteries, the job at the crematorium came up. You know, same um, Wakefield Metropolitan. And I moved over there. So I went there then. And to be quite honest with you, it, it, it was a good job. I enjoyed it there. And in all honesty, looking back, Sean, I think I should have spent my time there and not gone trying to do my Robin Hood crusade. You know, <laughs> you know I you... mean, some people might find it slightly depressing being surrounded by so much death and grieving families. Yeah, well, you, to be quite honest with you, you've got to have this kind of, well, you, you need that kind of humour like you've got at prison service. It's like this, what we call a black humour that, you know, uh, you, you take everything on the chin, you don't look at things for what they really are. You know, the only thing that had never upset me, they were babies. Oh. That used to really, mm. yeah, that cut me in half. Oh, but anything else, we're fine. Um, you know, we used to get on with it. Don't get me wrong, it's someone's mum and dad, it's someone's parent, it's someone's child. But you, someone's got to, by the same token, do the end of life process. And that's all I did as I looked at it. But I have got a damn good story about one of them as well, Sean. Go on, man. Um, and I'm sure the people out there will remember this guy, a guy called uh, Mal Kirk, he was a wrestler. Called him King Kong Kirk. He was from Featherston, West Yorkshire. He was a big lad. Oh, big lad. He once chased me around a cafe in Crofton. If he'd have caught me, he'd have probably killed me. But he was too fat to catch me at the time, you know. But anyway, uh, we got notice from this undertaker saying that uh, Malk had died and that he'd got funeral. He'd come up to measure the, crema uh, the cremator because Malk was that big. So they measured the cremator. Yeah, yeah, he'll go in. There's an inch either side. We'll get this, no problem. So obviously on the day, we were a bit apprehensive, well, me and my friend, who I worked with for 10 years there, Pete, and we were like, hope oh, this goes on out this, you know. So when he came through, because there's like a, in a, in chapels, you'll have been to crematoriums, they have like a, a false door, what opens when all the family's gone and the, the body comes through and it goes onto a thing called a beer at the back, which is like a set of wheels, runners, which you pump up to the height of the cremator and then the doors open and the body's placed in. Now, when Malt came through onto that beer, that, that beer is controlled by hydraulics, which is a powerful thing, as we all know. The thing went down about six inch because of his weight. So we were like, oh, my God. So we're trying to pump it. It was really hard to pump. We pumped him up to height. We opened the door to put Malk in. As we put, went to push him in, he got stuck because the undertaker hadn't measured for the handles on the coffin. So at that point, things are starting to warm up a little bit, Sean. We've got flames on the coffin, you know, because the heat off the cremator has now ignited the... What they call it. Uh, so we've got to then make a, an adjustment. So I had to then take the, knock the angles off, but then put the angles on the top. So everything went, what was there, everything went with Malk, but the angles had to come off. So we knocked the angles off, we pushed him in, we put the door down, and no word of a lie, them cremators at that time would melt down at 1300 degrees. The cremator were vibrating, banging. It would at 12, 1257, 1258. And I'd opened the back door, me ready to run, because I thought this is going to melt down. We're going to have a meltdown in here. I opened the back door just to run out of it in case anything did happen, you know. But the cremator, he did himself, did melt, not a thermogas on that guy. He was that big, he did himself. He took an hour and 45 and not a thermogas. Yeah. How long does a body usually take? About an hour and a half, an hour and 40. But usually that's with um, gas on them as well. You know, because obviously you've got to get things going and, you know, get it warm in there or whatever. But Mal just, he was so big, just sort of, you know, went himself. 
Kevin, didn't that stuff ever spook you or give you nightmares? Especially the knocking on the coffin while they're... No, running. do you know, in, in the 10 year I was there, I only ever had one dream. And I dreamt this chap had jumped out of the cremator and we're on top of cremator and I was stood there eating a pork pie and saying to him, come on, it's your turn, come on, back in here. <laughs> and that was a dream. And that was the only dream in 10 years. That bizarre. That's bizarre. Isn't it? Bizarre. And that was the only dream in 10 years. <sighs> You've mentioned... Um, while you were telling that story that King Kong was chasing you around a cafe. Yeah. Why was that? Well, he was like like what we was called bouncers in them days, didn't we? You know, uh, now the security men. Um, he was bouncing on door on a night at Redbeck in Crofton, which is a busy cafe. Everybody knows Redbeck. And he was there and it was a Saturday night and we'd all been up for a drink uptown and everything. And uh, he was sort of saying to us, hey, keep it down, you lads, beer. Because we were being silly idiots. You know, I had some beers. And um, I must have said something a little bit nasty to him, like, you know, you're fat, so-and-so. And he went, yeah, I'll tell you. So my, and he comes running over, and I managed to get around this table. But if he'd have got hold of me, him, he'd have, honestly, he were huge. Well, King Kong Kirk, he were huge. And I'm running around this cafe, and he was chasing me, and I set off running back home. I thought, I ain't going back in for that dinner. You can have it, can King Kong. You know what I mean, me? <laughs> so I went off. What was the training like then to become a prison officer? Yeah, it was it was very strict. It was good. We were, we all lived in together at um, Aber, Aberford Road, Wakefield, which is now an housing estate. And now I don't know how they train them now. Ridiculous. But we all lived in together. Um, we only had weekends where we went to them, you know, um, and that was nice because I only lived sort of four mile away. But a lot of lads couldn't get home. It wasn't, wasn't feasible. But yeah, what a good good building, good team building course for that. And it was very inspirational how they taught you. But like, they'd have all history there, you know, prison service, they'd have loads of things there that you'd never seen, like, um, you know, weapons and things that they'd found. And, you know, people in, in normal public had never come across all that. Where, yeah, it was good. I think now it's very, very sparse. That's probably what's going wrong with service. What was the most fascinating weapons they showed you? Well, most fascinating weapons I've seen is in Wakefield Prison. Uh, what they've confiscated off inmates. And guns. Guns? Yeah, guns made from uh, wood. But obviously they know how to make them and then the, they've got a firing uh, pin, you know, to fire the bullet through it. And, oh, yeah, there's some beauties. Um, and getting back to... Uh, well, a weapon. One incident I had with a weapon in Newall, a woman came down from the health care, which were like, they were more ill in the head than poorly on themselves. And officers obviously have to search them before they leave there, before they get put onto another wing. But obviously they hadn't searched this woman right, because when she came down to us, she was about 70, and everybody had got them off to work, and... Uh, she pressed a buzzer. So I went to her, I said, what, what's my, she went, I want some hot water for a cup of tea, love. So I went, no, you get that when everybody's out ready for work, then you go back in. She went, I, I didn't know that. So can I have some hot water? So most officers would have said, no, you can't. You'll have to wait until, you know, dinner time when you let out. But I thought, oh, she's 70. I said, right, okay. I said, on this occasion, I'll let you out. Just get your water, but straight back in. Yeah, of course. So she went and got the hot water. Then I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm only officer on this wing. She's got a pot of boiling water in her hand. Mm. So I'm stood back like a bit and I'm going, right, in there, please. And she went in and then she just went, do you want to come in my cell? <laughs> and I went, no, we don't go in cells, love. You go in them and we stop out this side, you know, making a bit of humour. And she went, well, just one moment. I thought, oh, Jesus, what's going on? She come to the door and she went, that's for you. And she gave me this shard of glass that she'd taken out of her, her TV screen up in healthcare that they hadn't searched officers up there. And that was intended for someone. And I thought, if I'd have turned her down for that hot water and then opened her up at dinner time, because she said to me, I'll give you this like this because you're a nice man, you. You'll let me have tea. And I thought, so if I'd have been a nasty man, where would that have ended up? And if I'd have got that shard through me, you know. 
Was it just women's prisons that you worked in? Uh, no, I worked at um, Wakefield. I went there, well, I went to Wakefield um, <clears throat> on a, um, what they call it, a move. I went there to Wakefield, but it didn't work out. All right, we're going to get to that. Let, we're, yeah. we're still at your training right now. Yeah, training. So training, was there any challenges there for you in the training? Um, I think challenges were, you know, that you had to get to a certain level and a certain standard, and you felt that, have I got this standard? Have I got this level? But I did have, and, uh, you know, I finished with, like, honours, if you like. That was not a problem, and I felt great afterwards. But I think a lot of people did feel there were one or two dropped out, you know, they hadn't got what it took or they felt it was too much for them to take on board, like, you know. Did you have to reconstruct riots and things like that? Yeah, yeah. How do was that? That? Uh, that, were, that were difficult because you've got people who you know are throwing bricks at you, you know, <laughs> it'll all be wooden bricks and, you know, but you've got all your riot gear on and everything and what have you. But it has to be as realistic as you both can make it. You know, I don't want to hurt him because I know him. I'll be having a bite with him later. And he don't want to hurt me. But you have to try and make it as realistic as you can. And uh, yet it was difficult. And we do like sell tech outs. And they were difficult because you've got to wind somebody up and you've got to put locks on their hands, which if I were to put locks on your hands now, it would hurt you. You need a soft way to do it. You know, it, it does hurt. And that's the idea behind it. It's pain, which stops them. What do you think made some of the officers drop out? What part of the training? Um, fitness. A lot of them weren't fit enough. They were uh, too big, you know. They hadn't sort of took a diet on board before they went in at that time. Uh, they couldn't pass the um, bleep test. So rather than working on it, they just thought, well, you know what, I'll, I'll go somewhere else type thing. And did you have a particular role in mind while you were training? <clears throat> well, my... My initial goal in life when I got into prison service was well, obviously to make it a better service if I could, but I wanted to climb ladders, Sean. Yeah, the no word of a lie. I wanted to climb ladder. I took lots of exams so that if anyone wanted me, they didn't have to pay again for all them exams. I'd passed them all. I'd got all certificates. I'd got everything, the hostage negotiator. I'd got presentation skills. You know, I was just doing them all to get up to where I wanted to go. So I initially wanted to make a, a good impression, but then move on through ranks to a governor because I wanted to run my, deep down, I really wanted to run my own prison because I wanted to show how, in my opinion, a prison could be run with not as many incidents as what there is in most of them at the moment. So what was your entry-level position? Um... As in finishing and... What was you start? How did you start in the service? What was your job title after training? Just officer. Yeah, prison which, officer. Which yeah. prison were you assigned to? Well, that's another one. Brixton. But, but <laughs> Newell got in touch with me and said, well, would you like to come here? And I thought, seven miles away from my house, that's a no-brainer. And I'd been to Brixton, and anybody who knows Brixton... It's a very tasty area. Is Brixton. So you did go to Brixton right away? Oh, yeah, I went down to Brixton. First day at Brixton, what was that like? I didn't actually work it. I went in and uh, I was shown round wing. I was done this and, you know. Uh, and the guys down there, the the, the very disciplining Aryans is uh, down there. Uh, but the, they were trying to explain how they looked after Northerners, you know, let us do a, a, an early shift on a Friday and come back on a late shift on a Monday. So we got time to get home, you know. But it was too much. It was too expensive down there. It was an area that, no, not for me. Um, you couldn't, like, go to work in your uniform. Uh, it was too dangerous. You had to get changed at work. Uh, you'd be attacked in streets down there. Whereas here, you can walk around the supermarket. Nobody will bother you. You might get odd one who might have a comment at you, but, you know, the, they don't attack you. <laughs> you know, and that's what was happening down there. So, yeah, it wasn't it weren't the place for me to work on that. So you were a week in Brixton, and then you moved to, what was it called? Newhall. What was yeah. your first day at Newhall like? Uh, very good, I think, because I made, I made a lot of good friends there straight away. You know, uh, there were some lovely officers. The the training officer there, um, she was lovely. She was a lovely woman. Uh, 
she'd do anything to help us. So, yeah, it, it, it was a nice environment, really, to work in it at first, you know, other than obviously behind walls, that you know, that would have been uh, times tasty. But as, as for everyone who worked there, there were only the odd one, you know, that were, oh, you couldn't tolerate type thing. What was it like interacting with the um, prisoners for the first time? Well, to be honest with you, right from starting that job, I found it easier with prisoners than prison officers. That sounds strange, I know, but I always worked on the assumption, me, be friends, but don't, uh, be friendly, but don't be friends. Because once you cross the line, that's when your life ain't going to be worth working. But the prisoners, they could always relate to. And, and what else is what else happens in that? Burn a uh, uh, saint and altar card in your hands, and you actually take an oath. And what is that oath? The oath is if you violate what you know about uh, this life, betray your brothers, you'll die and burn in hell. It's like saint is burning in your hands. And do you accept that oath? And I said yes, I do. Did you meet him? Not many times. Yeah. What was he like? Great. I mean, I enjoyed it. Constantly be thinking, wherever you go, that somebody one day may tap you on the shoulder. I, it's, it's and exactly what they would see as revenge for you breaking the, yeah. the code. I know that that's a possibility, yes. I mean, to me, it would be ridiculous to assume you hadn't. You can't be a mafia captain for that length of time, in charge of that number of people, and not kill people, can you? Well, well let me put it this way, you know, it's a violent life at times, mm. and if you're part of the life, you're part of the violence. And yeah, as a captain, I was given an order, told what to do, I did it. What do you think happened to him? There's two schools of thought. He hung himself, or he was murdered. Not only did I spend time in that prison, I spent time on that tier. Right. Because I was in lockdown there. I mean, all those things happening at one time, the cameras are gone, the guards fall asleep. It doesn't happen. Mm. When I was in there, they were watching me 24-7. Because I'm from a rough and ready background, a mining village. They're basically from the same sort of places as me. And as I used to say to them, look, don't ever look at me as though I'm some kind of ogre to you. I'm just a guy who never got caught, but you did. So don't ever look at me differently to yourselves. And they respected that. And right from, right from going in, you know, I'd say it to them as it was, you know, straight off cuff. I just said, look, you show me that respect and I'll give you respect. If I swear, you swear, but don't if I don't. And that worked to treat. That worked to treat. But most of them, you see, wouldn't do anything like that. You know, they wanted it their way, did officers, and that were that. Whereas if you'd given that bit of respect, then they're the human beings. They're not animals, you know. And yeah, some of them are in there for uh, audible crimes, but... You've got to, you know, show some kind of respect. What were your first challenges? First challenges were, I would say, hospital wing. Because upon hospital wing, as I've said earlier, they weren't ill. They were just poorly in head and really mentally ill, some of them. So because I've never been medically uh, or mentally trained, should I say, I had no idea how to handle it. So none of us had on the... So it was really difficult how to understand what they were doing and which way things were going. You could talk to them like we're talking and, you know, rationally, but they're just like, woof, just go. And you think, Jesus, well, you know, what's going on here type thing. But that was challenging. So what was the first bit of trouble you came across? Well, first first bit of trouble I came across, really, what I can talk about is um, one girl who, she'd just come into us upon healthcare but she would absolutely gone ahead with uh, drugs, you know, over years. She'd blown her brain. It had gone. So there was no way you could really talk to her. We couldn't let her out at cell. She was too dangerous. But yet she got this sort of transfixed onto me for some reason. I could tell when I came onto wing, she'd, she'd be looking out at inspection and she'd be sort of pouncing about, you know, and I, I was thinking, why? What, what have I? I never said anything. I've done anything. And anyway, this particular day, this uh, SO and another female officer, two females, 
came up and said, well, we need to take so-and-so to, uh, what they call it, to um, video link. So I said, well, I wouldn't open it if I were you. I just would not open that. Well, we've got to get her on video link. I said, well, explain that at the moment we can't get her out. No, I'm having her out. So I said, right, I've got to put it in observation book that I'm recommending you do. Put it in. As soon as they opened the door, they said, right, uh, we need you for a video link. Get your paperwork. And she's like, straight away, straight on to me, locked on to me. And then she just turned around and she went, paperwork, paperwork, get me paperwork. And she's going like this, and I'm thinking, oh. So she's grabbing things offside and all of a sudden just shot off the door, just run, not these two straight out of the way, these two females, just straight out of the way, straight at me. And she had a, a knife, you know, what she'd sharpened, a plastic knife. She went straight for me head with this plastic knife. But luckily I dodged her and I gave her a close line, to be honest. She had to go down, there's only me there. She had to go down. So she went down on floor, other officer rang bell. So obviously then you've got cavalry that's coming. They're all running over, you know, but you've got that time. So that's my first incident here where I'm thinking, oh my God. And she was so strong with drugs. Even I'm a big bloke and I was strong at the time. And I'm trying to hold her and I couldn't hold her. I just could not, her hands were getting further up my hands and her nails were about six inch long. And she's like shoving them into me. And, you know, it was really, it was as though whiz cavalry type thing, you know. I couldn't hold them much longer. Anyway, they got there and um, one of the young officers who joined just after me, she bent down too near her and she grabbed her hair. But what she did was she twisted it and twisted it and twisted and chose what we did to her. She would not let go of her hair. And then her head started bleeding. She was screaming, oh. officer. Blood were running down her face. And that was my first encounter, that. So you can imagine, I felt like, oh, my God, what have I joined here? And it took a lot to get that woman off, I'll tell you. It took a lot. Did, but, she, did she calm down after that? Yeah, but only when she was placed back in her cell. She, what as I said to her, to her SO, Kim, don't let her out. But she won't listen to me. These women sound vicious. Some very they vicious. Sound, would very. you say it was worse than a men's prison? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in men's prisons, you very rarely see uh, a lot of violence, but when you do, it's usually a death because when they've got it in for somebody, they've got it in for them. And when they've got squat, whatever they've got squat. But the, luckily, it's not usually officers that are taking it out on. It's usually, you know, other inmates who've done heinous crimes. What, so, what was the second incident second um looking back i'm trying to think back now sean the second incident that were probably um a woman who came in from leeds who she were, if you were to see her now it just looked like somebody you got out of jungle that had been stuck in jungle for about 30 years you know wild and they were just all wild and like the makeup she had on her eyes were running down her face but she never got a wash and all that and she were on segregation unit and we used to have to, on there, well, same as any cells at Newall, there's like an hot uh, water pipe runs through cells. That keeps them warm, you know. And on segregation, it's like low down. So we used to have to make a sit down on pipe while we went in with food. And then we'd back out, like reversing back out, not turning your back. And then she'd be like that and we'd be, stay there. So, and obviously you'd be on edge, you know, but there'd be two of you, like, just in case. And uh, she won't like, well, she, she'd just throw dinner at you, stuff like that. We don't, you know, I've had that where she's thrown dinner at me. She's splattered upside at walls, you know. Oh, just, and then one day, it was only about six months after that, a taxi were coming up. And they were obviously what we used to call OSGs. They were like support officers, you know, walking up with taxis. So I pulled him. I said, what, where's that taxi? Where's it going? Segregation unit. I said, why was it going? Well, they found that that woman from Leeds is uh, in on a technicality. She shouldn't be in. I said, are they going go in a taxi? Yeah. <laughs> so this woman who we'd been controlling like a Rottweiler for the last six months, well, now we're going to get in a taxi 
with an Asian gentleman who hadn't got a clue what was coming. <laughs> I was just like, I'm out of here. You know, I'm like... I hope he was all right. <laughs> I've never heard nothing about him since. <laughs> wow. So I don't know how he got her back to Leeds, but that was another incident. You know, and it was, to be honest with you, Sean, incident after incident in women's prisons. Incident after incident. What was the third you- one? <laughs> on, on, well, on third one, um, I mean, major incidents. Like I went on nights... And uh, as soon as I went there, a key officer said, you've got to ring all the officers straight away. Well, I went, what's that? No, you've got to ring him. I don't know. You've got to ring him. So I rings all the officer, like who's like the governor in charge, you know, at that time when there's no governors there. Uh, what's what's matter like? What do you want? Uh, right, well, go straight to Ewing, Kevin. Uh, I want you to pick this prisoner up. Um, she's all slashed up with a coffee jar. Uh, I need her health care straight away. So I went over for her. She's there, like, just an arm from here to here, but just, like, wide open. And oh. it's just, like, all fat hanging, you know, and all. Oh. And I'm like, what are you doing? She, ah, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. So I'm having to wrap it up for her and take her to healthcare. And just to see someone like that when you've just come on to work, on to shift, it's bad. But then on that occasion, I think I'm all right, isn't it? On that occasion, I saw, like, some absolute poor action that I've ever seen in my life. A nurse who was such a vindictive woman, she went on this shift, took her in, told her what had happened. So she took me to one side while the prisoner was in the chair. She said, right, I'm going to stitch her arm. But because she's put me through this at this time on a night... She's only going to get half an arm. Uh, what did they call it? Um, anesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. I said, what, what do you mean? No, she's getting half an arm and the other half she'll feel. And she, she told the prisoner, this is true, this, this is true. She told the prisoner, we've run out of anesthetic, so we can do half your arm, but you'll have to suffer the other half. And obviously she wanted it stitching. And she said to me, are you all right to cut stitches? I'd never I'd never done anything medical. So I just said, yeah, if you, I'll do it. So she stitched her and I was cutting them while she was tying them off. And then we got to the part where, you know, oh, my God. it was, She was absolutely screaming. And all that nurse kept doing was smiling at me. Oh, yeah. sadistic. I, I was just like, I just said, look, I don't want to, you know. But I couldn't report it because you report anything. You know, you, don't get me wrong, I put it in my book that I was as bad as them because I, I didn't report it. So I was like condoning it. But if I'd have reported it, I'd have been ostracised. No one would have spoke to me ever again. I'd have been shoved down at doors and lost everything. And at that point, I didn't think my career was going to end how it ended. So I had to run along with it, you know, but I, I, I didn't like that. I bet um, women's prisons is rife for self-harming, but did you yeah. hear of much people actually going to take their lives? Oh, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen that. I've seen so many hangings. Um, what was the first one? First one, um, a young girl who she'd been abused by all her family. All her family had abused her. And a lovely last she was, lovely. And she would only, at that time, she'd be about, 18. Oh, my goodness. And she were forever cutting up. She were forever doing this, that. And then she started calming down a little bit, but then it was as though it came all back to her and it just got too much for her. And one night I went on nights and I, I picked up a set of nights, which I went on a, a, a wing called G-Wing, which is a semi home wing, which, to be quite honest with you, Sean, uh, you could run because it's so laid back. Women on there are all, you know, calm. They've got their own key for the room and everything. I thought, dropped on a right week here. This is me watching TV on a night. Oh, yeah. First night, I was called to go to healthcare. I got an incident, and it was this young lady. Uh, she'd slashed her arms, her legs, uh, the blood everywhere. But then she wanted to fight with us as well. So we were rolling right floor with her. I was covered in blood. And when we got done... We were told to door had to be left open and it had to be a 24-hour watch then, you know. So we sat watching her 
And she just came over to the door to me and she just said, I'm really sorry, Mr. Graham, for putting all that blood on you. I said, look, don't worry about it. All I want you to do is just go lay down, go to sleep, love, forget about it. I'm all right. And with that, she went, but I went to nurse and said, look, shouldn't we be taking her to hospital? Shouldn't we get her out of here? Because she's ripped up everywhere, you know. She said, no, if she wants to do that, let her suffer. Same nurse as the other one? No, it was another one, actually. But it was a good friend of hers. The one pair of them were really bad. And I was just like, I don't believe this. I can't believe somebody medically trained is talking like this. You know, if that had been my decision, I would have run for an ambulance. But this girl had to be wrapped up in bandages and just laid on bed. And she was still... Then bandages were full of blood and, you know... Obviously, she weren't feeling pain or whatever, for whatever reason, I don't know. But she, you know, she sort of went to sleep and that one out. Whereas I, I should imagine one of us would be writhing in pain, you know, but no, she weren't. So, but yeah, that was another incident that, uh, and then she went on to uh, kill herself. She was actually on a, a watch. Her an officer came away from the door because there was an incident which he shouldn't have done, shouldn't have left her. But he came away from the door and uh, she hung herself from taps on a sink. And she would only, at that time, maybe 20. From she would only young. Sink, from the sink yeah, taps? Yeah. Like, quite leaned. Yeah, just like sort of got a neck and then down like that, you know, with weight. Mm. Was hanging the most common method they used? Yeah. Yeah. I cut a woman down nine times in an hour. Nine, nine times. times? And it got to a point where I said to the nurse, look, when we're going next time, we need to strip her. I said, she's got to be stripped. Because we used to do techniques where she'd be on the floor and male officers would have the back to her, but holding locks. So holding her in locks, but not looking at her because she's going to be stripped. And obviously, you know, I don't want to take away her dignity. So I'm trying to sorry, visualise this. So she's the first time she's using something like bedding, I'm presuming. Yeah. What would, did she use the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh? Um, Anything she'd get her hands shirt, on? You know, like a, a shirt, she'd tie a sleeve around her neck. Um, anything she had in there, what she'd get, get her hands on, shoelaces, anything. Uh, but she used to tie them so tight, it was unbelievable. And on the last uh, occasion, when we, well, it, I thought they'd stripped her. I mean, she had what they call a strip dress on then, which she can't rip them strip dresses. I don't think they're allowed to use them anymore. But anyway, she had this strip dress on. So we came out. And we're all talking and sort of having a bit of banter about this, you know, and oh, that's the you know, eighth time I've been in there. And I just looked up at monitor and she was doing it again. I said, what? I said, I thought we'd stripped her. But she said, no, I didn't take her briefs off. I was like, no, no. So we had to go back in again, we had to wrestle it at the floor again. And then obviously her briefs had to come off with us, with us backs to her, you know. And when we got out, we are all talking again and somebody said, oh, we're going to have us, us brewing, what have you now. Like, so I'm looking at monitor and she's like there on bed, you know. So, yeah, let's have a brew. Like, so I felt some of my hands. I looked at my hands and I thought, oh, I don't believe this. She must have had a, a period. Um, and these pants that we grabbed on the way out to get them out of the way, they were full of menstrual and I were full of it then. So that was another dirty incident, if you like. But that was, as I said, I've been among so many incidents, you know. I could probably sit here all day talking about them, you know. Dirty and that's protests? How, oh, dirty protests. I've I done that one. I was just about to ask about what, that. What was the story on that one? Well, this this woman we had in, she was from London. And um, I think she was shipped up to us because she was trouble from Holloway. Anyway, she started all this business carrying on about, you know, I'm this and I do this and... Anyway, we were like, look, you're not doing any of that. And this doesn't happen in this prison. And so next thing we knew, she started doing a mess and daubing it all over the wall. So then what we had to do then, <laughs> oh, this is unbelievable. We had to put white suits on, you know, and we got, I think, what, £2 a day or £2.50 a day or something different, I don't know, in pay. But we had to put these white suits on, white masks, and we started putting a mattress up against the door to stop, you know, any smells or... But next thing you'd see were blue bottles. 
to start flying in blue bottles and they says, oh, they know that, you know, they can smell it from miles. Mm. And then we had all this to put up with. And then this doctor came up one day on wing because they used to come every week and uh, he was an Asian fella. And he came on, oh, I'm here too, you know. And I, yeah, okay, I'm here. So I'm opening doors. Oh, this is Dr. Khan, you know, whatever his name was at the time. I'm just saying that name. Uh, and, the, yeah, no, I'm all right. No, I'm fine, fine. We got to her. Oh, uh, uh, what she replied were unbelievable. But how he took it, I've got to say that, he took it straight on, chinned it, chap, never lost his temper, just said, uh, okay, I'll see you later then. But she shouted to him, F off you. You know. Oh, my goodness. And that was that. And I was like, I think I said, hey, hey, we don't. And he just said, close the door. We're okay. We're okay. What about um, female inmates having relations with the guards? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Right. Well, that happened to someone who I would never have ever thought. Uh, this chap, I think he'd done 12 years at the time. Great guy. I still say that to him now, but let himself down with this inmate. Um, now, I didn't think for one minute he'd ever get into a relationship or even be interested in a prisoner. You know, he was married, two kids. He, he seemed really happy. And then all of a sudden, one day, a black inmate who we'd just got come from Ascombe Grange, who sort of befriended me, who were, uh, she was like a snitch. We used to call it dynamic security. We'd have somebody who snitch, you know, without them knowing. And she pulled me and said, I need a word with you, Mr. Graham. I said, wow, what's going on? She went, I can't sleep on a night. I goes, wow, what's the matter? She went, that Mr. I said, oh, yeah. She went, he's doing her next door to me. So I went, what do you mean? He's do They're at it all night. They're at it. I said, oh, give up. Don't start talking silly. She went, Mr. Graham, I am telling you. I said, well, if you're telling me and you want to put your name to this, I'm going to have to go into security and report this. Yeah, yeah, happy. Went in, saw my friend who was uh, PO at the time. Great guy. I said, I've got to, I've got to report this to you, like I said, I've just been told by so-and-so. And he went, is it so-and-so? So I went, yeah, do you know? Because this is how it was in security. Nobody had ever talked to one another. <laughs> we wouldn't, I wouldn't know if something would happen now with the security. I wouldn't know unless they wanted me to know, uh, you know, upper management. He said, don't worry about it, Kevin. Don't put papers in. We're observing him now. He's being watched. But keep that to yourself. I said, oh, I don't, I'm not interested in that. Next thing, he got suspended. She went on to the segregation unit, but she only had a couple of days left to do on a sentence. So she weren't saying anything. She went out on release, but she had a flat in Leeds. But what they did was craftily, they moved him to Armley, out of the female estate. So... While he was at Armley, every dinner time he would go into her flat. But the private detective were following him. So when he came back for his hearing at Newall, my gaffer at that time in security said to him, right, do you want to sign this and you'll get your pension and be gone today? Or you can go into tribunal. He went, I have nothing to answer to, I'm going in there. He said, well, do you want to look at that then? And he passed him a CD. And he went, what's that? And he told him, he went, give me that to sign. And signed it. Yeah. And uh, I would never, ever, if somebody would have told me, you know, other than her that day, I'd have said, no, nah, no, nah, not him, not him. But that did happen. And it would happen in, on quite a few occasions. I've, you know, been privy to it. What about females trying to seduce the male staff yeah. into bringing contraband in? Yeah, that happens any as well. Stories, any stories there? Well, it's hard to find them on that because... If you uncover them, then I would never have tolerated that, I'll be honest with you. That's one I would have sort of gone to town on because once once they get you bringing anything in, like, um, I don't know, a packet of cigs, say, then after that, bring me a gun. A gun? What are you talking about? A gun? Well, you brought me some cigs. If you don't bring it, I'll tell the governor. So, you know, you're in a lot of trouble. You're sucked in. So I would never have tolerated anything like that. But I know it were happening because I know with some of the stuff we found in there, uh, that had come from outside, mobile phones. Um, one chapel were having a bit of a fling with one of the inmates. He brought her uh, a lot of lingerie. Yeah. 
<laughs> and when it got, yeah. Why would you want lingerie in prison? Well, on nights, you see, it's most officers, I would say 99% are fast asleep, where there's always that one who has to go around doing electric points, and he will have been that one. Are you with me? <laughs> and that's where that came in. Did anyone come to you to bring stuff in? Oh, yeah, I've, I've been asked. I've been asked uh, on numerous occasions, but I've just said, nah. What do you think I am like? Charlie Caroni or what? Do you think I'm a clown? What kind no, of things would they say to you? They'd offer sex. Oh, they would try oh, and seduce you? Straight away they'd offer sex. Yeah, no problem. Um, and they'd, they'd go into it in detail, you know, what they were prepared to do and when everything else. And I'd just be like, go away, go away, you know. <laughs> but I know it would have taken place. I know, I know for a fact it would have taken place with some people. Uh, and... They never, a lot of them didn't get caught, but, you know, odd few did. And that's where it then became a little bit sort of naughty because they were looking at you as well at the same time. You know, if you were like friends with him, then maybe you were dropping into his ways where you were covering up for him. You know, I had a friend who were pulled on a bag search one morning. He were in front of me and uh, he opened his bag up and he had... Uh, Two dozen condoms in. Yeah, yeah. Two dozen condoms, cigs in. Yeah, don't, he didn't smoke. So he would ask by security, what are you doing? Like, well, I'm living in a tent. So I take these in case anybody comes back with me and I bring all my <laughs> possessions to work. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And he got away with that, I don't know. You tell me, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, no, that's, that's the best thing I've ever heard of me. I'm living in a tent, so if someone comes back with me that I pull, mm. all right. He's got his little... <laughs> his little... <laughs> his little machine there, know what he Making needs. love mm. bag. Yeah. What the yeah. hell? <laughs> what about if a female prisoner was in a relationship with another female prisoner? Didn't that cause a lot of drama? Yeah. Nah. <laughs> yeah. That's where my career went wrong. Because these two females had got this thing for one another. And on this particular day, I were walking across to a wing when there were what they call movement. You know, uh, they're all going to work at different areas at prison. And so I was walking over with these girls because invariably they'd walk with me talking and chatting and laughing and, you know. And this one were talking away and, and I was telling them a joke. And they were all laughing, including this girl who was, stood next to me. But unknowings to me, the girl who were having a relationship with her, I started thinking that I were having a relationship with her. So she's like blaming her for going home with this officer and Lord, of bunk them. But obviously she got it into her head and, you know, so she told this girl to put accusations in about me, that I was making advances and that I'd uh, um, touched her inappropriately, inappropriately and all this. And it really did, it got out of hand. I got suspended uh, six months. I got arrested by West Yorkshire Police. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I got taken down, uh, meant to look a right idiot in cells at Wakefield by a, a, a clown. If he's listening to this, yeah, you're a clown. Um, he was like a custody officer who were determined to let everyone know that I were a prison officer and that I were there on... Uh, Sexual assault. Oh, uh, my God. Do you know what I mean? And I'm trying to talk quiet to him because, obviously, I'm not trying to bring attention to myself. I know I'm innocent. I've not got a problem with that. I know I'm innocent. But he's trying to make it so that everybody who's sat in this cell area knows I'm a prison officer. So that one, they don't like them, do they? Anybody who's an inmate. So he's trying to cause bother there. How long are you in there for? Oh, I was only there uh, arrested for, well in cell area for about, I don't know, three hours. And did anyone make any moves on you? No, nobody nobody even said a word to me. Nobody, I got a few looks off people, but nobody uh, made a move on me. But I, at that point, I was going through a bad stage because police had been to my house and they'd said, you've got to move out of this house because you've got a minor. And, uh, you know. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I've done nothing wrong. This is this is nothing wrong. And so I had to move into my bungalow. My oh. wife was running a pub. What? Yeah, this is true, is this? And <clears throat> so obviously at this point, I'm starting to lose it because 
I'm thinking, am I going to appear in court for this? Because I've done nothing wrong, you know. So this guy who was trying to make an idiot out of me in front of all these people, he said to me, you can take them shoes off, you can take that belt off, and you can take that ring off, you know, meaning my wedding ring, right? So I said, uh, no. I'd got to a point where I thought, this is it. So I went, no, I'm not. So he went, you're not taking the ring off? I said, no, I'm not. I said, so if you want to out make out of it, let's do it now. So this sergeant who was sat behind him come over and he went, what's the problem here? So this guy went, he's the problem. So I goes, no, I'm not. He wants me to put take this ring off. When I put it on, I said, I put it on with vowels and that's stopping on. So he went, give him some tape. And he didn't like it, this blow. And I had to tape it up, but I wouldn't take it off. And at that point, I'd got to a point where, I, oh yeah, they got kicked all out room type thing. There were that many of them. But I'd just got to a point, Sean, where I'd had enough of them. I, it was as though I couldn't prove my case. I could not get it over. And this was all through just having a joke. <sighs> all through having a joke. And they took all this uh, sort of attitude and... Oh, it was unbelievable what happened to me from, from that point on. It was unbelievable how the prison service trapped me, how the police trapped me. And I'd got two inmates, and had I not had them two girls on my side who told the truth, one of them were black, lovely girl, love her. She, the, the detective who came to me on the last day with a paper, because the solicitor went with me and said, Kevin, I think they're going to arrest you today. You're going to go to a count court. I said, David, I've done no wrong. He said, well, they won't answer the phone to me. He says, and it looks to me like they're going to, you know. And he come walking out of this white paper. So this solicitor said, is that what I think it is for Kevin? He went, oh, no, no, no. See, we're even pushing it that far. He went, no, that's someone else, that. He went, uh, just come, uh, Kevin, uh, there's nothing to answer to. West Yorkshire Police are quite happy that you've done nothing wrong and uh, there'll be no further charges. And I was, I was like, hey, is this it? Is this it? I said, well, can I have a letter? I need a letter to show people. No, we don't give letters. No, wow. it? I've just left like that. And then I had to go back to prison and then talk to a uh, number one governor who just, well, it was ridiculous how I was trapped. Kevin, why did those two female prisoners back you up? Right, well, when I went back to uh, New Orleans, um, She'd come back in, the black girl, she'd been out and come back in, and I didn't know she was back. And she shouted me from her cell. I said, I'm coming over there later, I'll come and see you. So I went to have a word with her like, I said, listen, thank you for what you did. I said, she said, Mr. Graham, I were with you that day. She said, you were nowhere near that cupboard. I was supposed to have gone in a cupboard and, and touched the boobs or something. She said, you were nowhere near there. I were with you all the time on that wing. She said, I know you wouldn't do anything like that. You've always been fine with us all. We've not. She said, and I told that copper, that's how she said it, I told that copper that if this goes to court, I want to go to any court in this country to defend you. <laughs> do you know what he said to me, that copper? Go on. Well, on the day that he said he'd let me, you know, he was done with. He said, and that black girl, had she not been black, he said, I'd have swore you were her dad. <laughs> that's what he said he said the way wow. she spoke about you and defended uh. I said listen mate she's defended me for a reason because I did nothing wrong and it sounds like the inmates treated you better than your own Correct. colleagues and that's exactly how I felt and to back end that's really how it got where it was in you know and inmates if I'd have gone in front of them for an hearing they'd have all acquitted me but officers no if, I'm going to quickly pop to the... Yeah, go for it. I'll keep going. <clears throat> so, so, Kevin, how far into your career did all of this craziness happen? Six years. Six years, yeah. Six years in? Yeah, and then... And you were at Newhall that entire time? Yeah. Well, basically, Sean, yes. But I did go to uh, Wakefield because I thought that Wakefield would be my salvation. Before we go to Wakefield then, are there any other incidents or stories from Newhall that you've not told us that you want to cover? Well, um, I mean, I've got lots of stories. Lots of I've got some funny stories. I've got some really dark stories. Um, but I just feel that the people who were in charge at the time I were there, the number one and the number two, 
really give me an hard time, a real hard time for nothing. I'd done nothing wrong. All I'd done in that system were good. And anyone else would tell you the same, but, well, they would if they dare repeat that, but they probably didn't. Um, but at Newall, I just felt that I were robbed of my career. They robbed me of my career. Definitely. And I, I feel bitterness towards them, especially them two, who got found out later, bullying another governor. She got sent to, uh, well, she had to jump before she were pushed. She ended up in uh, Red Cross in uh, Switzerland, working for them. He ended up working under the um, area manager. The keys were taken off him. He couldn't enter a, a prison for four years because of what he'd done. And my friend who was the governor, who still is my friend, um, and he's still a governor, he got rewarded highly for that, for the behaviour that they did and what they did to him. And I mean, they nearly they, they played a big part of his brain. You know, he's, he's, he's been under psychology a long time. Uh, and that's all because of them too, what they did. But they got found out for him, but not for me. And they wouldn't listen because I was just an officer. He was a governor, so they listened to him. So I do think Newall, it, it, it still owes me a lot, but I'd never get it back. I've got a few more questions about Newall then before we go to Wakefield. Yeah, sure. So earlier on, you said that, you know, Rachel Agar was dangerous in a certain way, but there were other females who were dangerous in other ways. Yeah. What, what did you mean by that? What I mean by that, Sean, is... Um, they calculated um, that they'd be thinking about things and you could tell that they were like sort of thinking about how they could get at whoever. Like I watched an incident one day where we had a, a female officer who, who passed out with me. But she was, she was all right, but she was too verbal towards prisoners and, you know, too aggressive towards them. And this particular day, I'd picked up on this wing that these two who were not a bit nifty sort of thing, they got a brain in between them uh, to work out a situation. They got it in for this girl. And I was stood on landing and I saw them arranging to drag her into a cell. And I knew what they were going to do. So I shot off this landing, went down to this cell because she were coming on what we used to call um, uh, LLB, LBBs, locks, bolts and bars, where you check them every day in cells. And they were waiting for them to get to her room. So I got to their room before her. And I said, right, I've been watching you. I know exactly what you're doing. You're waiting for her. And Anna, I said, no, you are. You're waiting. Well, she shouldn't be like she is with us. And we're going to show her. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. And I stopped that situation there and then. She had no idea, and this girl, what were coming. But what were coming for her were nasty. I've witnessed some of that, you know, where... They've jumped him or things like that, and we've had to intervene, you know. Have you got a story of that? Well, I have a, I have a, I have a story that, um, well, maybe shouldn't be told, but I am going to tell it on this occasion. One officer, um, she just hated men, just hated us. Didn't matter what you did, I tried my best with that woman. I tried making a tea, being nice to her, and... But no, she just hated you. She always wanted to sort of make you look a fool and things like that. And so I used to just leave her to one side. But as I was passing a wing one day, an inmate had jumped on her, on her back, and were punching her from back. And this woman, I hated her that much, I walked past. And that's true. And if you're still watching, I still hate you. I walked past because she would have done that to me. Yeah. She would have... She, if she had a, anything on me, she would have been to governor and sacked me. She was that nasty, awful woman. You know, I, I mean, I've no, no problems with any sexuality of anybody, uh, homosexual, lesbian, whatever. That's, that's their affair, not mine. But she just pushed the parameters all the time and it made it as though you were some kind of a problem to the lesbian community. I know a problem with lesbian, no problem at all. No, but she had a problem with us. And on that occasion, maybe I was wrong. Yeah, I probably was looking at uh, the, you know, 
a situation like that. But she just got me into a position where she'd made me look a fool so many times. I thought, no, why should I help somebody who wants to do that to me? And you mentioned earlier you were in with some pretty intense inmates. Were you in with any prolific killers? Um, yeah, there were, there were one or two there. Who, um, that's another story as well of a relationship. She killed um, someone who interfered with children who belonged to her, her family. And she killed this chap and um, put him down a sewer. And she was really nice to talk to. I could, I could sit here now talking to her and, you know, having a cup of tea with her. Really nice. It was just that she got this problem with him because of what he'd done, which I understand in some ways. Yeah, I understand. I imagine you know, she got respect for that, probably. She did, yeah. She had a lot more respect in there than what people knew, actually. She was running wing, really, you know, without any of us knowing. But uh, I found out later <laughs> she was also running hierarchy a bit as well because of her antics. What she was getting up to. And I nearly caught him one day. I walked in and... And uh, I nearly walked straight into it, but I didn't because I knew what was happening. But I'd, if I'd have seen it, I would have had to report it. And he was a friend as well, and I didn't want to do that. So, so I walked back out, but making them aware that I was there. So you're saying then there's a hierarchy in the female prison and the people at the top of that hierarchy can influence the staff hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. It has happened. I've, I've been there, I've seen it. Uh, and also I've seen um, female officers, you know, um, sort of what I might call in a decent way, bedding the way up to top, you know, because they've been uh, sort of, you know, doing them their antics after work with upper management and then they've ended up with them. Or affairs in, in services, especially prison service, is rife, absolutely rife. And I'm sure if I'd have still been there, I'd have probably left my wife by now. You know, and that's that's true. Me and her, we came to a crossroads in his life. And she said, you either get out of this. Or that's it, me and you was done. And I, I didn't realise how much in them years it had changed me. But she said to me, you'll go to your best friend. And I went to my best friend. I said to him, just tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. Have you seen a difference in me? Kev, he said, 100%. Said you've gone hundred percent. Don't even know you, and I didn't. I couldn't see that change, but he saw it, and he was quite happy to say it. And my wife was, and if I had to sort of come out when I did, well, I didn't want to come out at that time, but I was forced, if you like. But if I had to done, I'm sure I'd be somewhere now without her. Is the way to improve that situation to have more female officers in female prisons? Um. Well, I don't know because. How do I put this? I don't want to seem as though I'm sexual. Uh, but female officers aren't as strong as men, obviously. They're as good. Don't get me wrong. They've got brain better than ours. Some of the best decisions this country's ever been taken by queens. So, you know, that goes without saying. But I think they still need that male backup. For the physical restraining side. Yeah. I still think they need that male backup. And uh, I, I find, I tell you what I find when I went to Wakefield, I find it hard that women are on wings there because of the kind of people who's in there and the size of them. You know, if I were a female and there's some bonny girls who were on, you know, uh, prison staff, I'd be really scared, I'll be honest with you, you know, because they are, them, they are calculated, them guys, some of them. Before we go to Wakefield, I've just got a couple more questions on the other one. Um, what kind of crimes, convictions would get the most respect and what would get the prisoners' hate? Anything to do with children, that would get them hate. Nobody liked anybody with children. They didn't like that. Uh, respect were more um, bank jobs, you know, like ICE and things like that, ICE, or frauds, you know, because they're so much people who were clever who could work around things, so they give them respect for that, you know, but obviously they've got caught on this occasion. But there's a lot of people in there that uh, have got caught, but the money's still waiting for them. You know, they haven't lost it. It's still there. 
So they can throw the money around. Oh, yeah, inside. And and you'll see that, you know, they walk about like one minute and they'll come and they'll have a pair of, you know, Air Force One trainers on and things like Yeah. So in the women's prison then, with the white, the brown, the green, is that prevalent using yeah. the substances? Yeah. That, it's, it's rife in there. And is it staff bringing it in or is it visitors? <laughs> well, on, on a couple of occasions... We, we always thought that um, legal people were bringing it in. But you're not allowed to put dog on to legal people. It's not. So what we used to do, we'd set traps. We'd, we'd have chat with dog at the other side at visits. I'd be this side, and then I'd let him know he's coming through from so-and-so solicitors. So as he's coming through, he's walking through this way. As he's walking through this way with his dog, dog would sit on him. Uh, just a minute, your dog sat on you. Uh, have you been? We're well, not allowed to put a dog on me. Oh, we haven't put a dog on you. I've just walked past you. Do you know what I mean? Which is allowed. Dog sat. Well, you can go ahead with your visit, but it'll be closed, or you can leave now. They'd leave. They were carrying. But there was no consequences. No consequences. So it's worth the try. And I've had all, uh, you know, inmates have told me all stories of how bent they are and things, you know. And, and a friend of mine who were in open prison up near Blackpool there, uh, Kirkham, there were loads in there for what they'd done, you know. One of them were kicking off one day uh, because police were at his house and they were taking his helicopter because uh, he'd been gained by Ill ill-gotten gains. So they were taking this helicopter and they were kicking off like mad in prison. He were a barrister. Do you know what I mean? So th these guys, are, they're all out there, yeah, and they've got all this money, but they want more. Were you ever aware of drones being used to drop off stuff? Uh, well, there weren't drones, but what we used to have at Newall was we'd have pigeons <laughs> with all their insides ripped out and, and uh, drugs shoved in them and thrown over the fence. Or there'd be um, tennis balls stuffed and whack, you know, over the fence. That was another one. But, yeah, we used to have it all like that. That It would all be things that you wouldn't want to look at, you know, like a pigeon would be laid there dead. You'd think, oh, you know, Fox will get it or whatever later. But it'd be full of drugs. And then they'd pick them up on the way around to work, like, oh, yeah. So you mentioned some particularly despicable acts by staff members. Mm. Would you say that who was the most wicked staff member at the women's prison? Well, we had, um, as I said, them nurses, they were, they particularly, they come to mind. You know, they really do come to mind. But um, it were more on, on like, officer-based, really, because I'd never worked, really, with upper management in a close proximity, um, except on a couple of occasions where I noticed things, what were going on there. But it were mainly officers who would be, like, just awful, just, like I've had, I've, I've been to one day a girl came down from a bedroom, from a cell, and she came out onto landing and she's talking away to me and all this. And I said, oh, you need to see so-and-so about that. So she went to see him and she's rattling onto him, like, you know, and this and this and other. And he just stood there, like, looking in there like this, and I thought, oh, there's someone coming here, I know it. And then when she finished, she'd obviously poured her out at, her heart out about what, what problem. And he went... No, I can't listen to you. You've got slippers on. You should have your boots on on landing. So go back to your room, get your boots on and come back and tell me. She had to go all the way back to put a pair of boots on to tell him what she'd tell him in the first place. And I felt that were a bit like, you know, bullying that, harassment. And I said to him, right, it's my wing in it. Do what I want. You know what I mean? And that's how they are. And so you just think, you just walk on. Have you got any more questions about the female prison, Jen? What was the most vicious attack you've seen from a female prisoner to a guard? Only when we've been restraining, you know. Um, I mean, when we've been restraining them, then they're, they're obviously all let loose then. It's just, you know. But we, we're, like, controlled in what we're doing. Or we, I would always control anyway. It's always controlled as to getting them into a position where we can, you know, uh, safely leave them. But they would viciously go for you. If, if they could get at you, they would get at you, you know, and I've seen some vicious attacks and uh, for no reason, really, just, it's just in them. 
It's just in them. And I think a lot of drugs has to do with it. You know, drugs uh, drives them. And uh, it's unfortunate that some girls who are in that just, you know, get hooked onto that game and then it's just hell let loose for them in the life. And I think they don't mind having to go at anybody, whether it's an officer or a governor. They're not bothered. You've described some big, dangerous weapons that were handed over, but were any of the big, dangerous weapons used that you witnessed? I never witnessed any. No, I never witnessed any used. Uh, I can only say what I saw, and they were, like, some of them, you think, crikey, how did they ever make that? You know, and how did they make it out of that? But I don't know. I don't think I would be able to even make it now, even though I've seen it, you know, prototype type thing. So, yeah, they're clever people, but they've got a lot of time on their hands, you know. You imagine you're sat in that cell and you've all that time on your hands. So, you know, there's plenty of time to think about what they're doing. Did any of the women try to escape? Um, well, that was another bad incident, actually. It was a, a girl who, from Featherston. Um, she was a nice girl as well. But she was missing her kids, she was missing her home life, she was missing her mum, and she was in hospital at Pinderfields. And a friend of mine were doing bed watch on her and a female officer. So she wanted a toilet, so he took her to the toilet and he got her on what they call a closeting chain, which is three metres long, so she can go behind the door and shut the door, but obviously it's not shut, so you can get to her. But every now and again what you do is you'll pull the chain or you'll shout or, you know, to make sure that, but what he did was he didn't really check on her, unfortunately. And when he did go to pull the chain, the chain just come out on its own. So she'd gone through a window. But a friend of mine who used to have a taxi firm in Crofton, he's gone now, bless him. He was a security man at Pinderfields and he was driving around in, in his uh, car and he knew who she was because uh, he'd been on to Wings and seen her. And she pulled him and said, are you a taxi? And he went, yeah, I am, love. Went, yeah, right, I'll jump. She jumped in and he locked doors and just drove her back round to, <laughs> <laughs> to officers, you know what I mean? So unfortunately, she was brought back. <laughs> and that was another incident that uh, they told us we got to bring her back to prison then because if she weren't, she were doing things like that, she weren't poorly, she was taking up a bed. But when they got her back there, they didn't go through the right procedures. They put her onto a segregation unit. But what they didn't do, well, they didn't take things off her that they should have done. You imagine, in my estimation, at that time, I would have been thinking, she's severely depressed. To try that, to try and get home, she's missing her kids, missing her mum, we need to be careful here. They didn't. Next morning, she was hanging oh. with her uh, belt off her uh, dressing gown. Oh, they not removed it. So that were, uh, uh, that were actually a very unsavoury one because she were really nice. She were only a lass who were in a... Uh, I don't know, a cycle that she couldn't get out of. You know, she wasn't a bad girl. She was just someone who were caught in that cycle. And were there any riots there? No, we we had we came close once on uh, E-Wing. Oh, that was a bit scary, that one. There's 100 women on there. And what happened was, uh, let me just get numbers right here. I think there's four, four officers, one SO. But SOs very rarely come out of office and, you know, they're happy for officers just to be doing all mopping up, and there were three young officers that had just passed out, so they had no idea what they were doing, really. So it comes to lock-up, and I could tell with attitude in room what would happen. I went hanging over, landing upstairs, watching women, because they all knew me. I was an old sweat there. So they're all watching me, and I knew there was something coming. So Bell went for a lock-up, and nobody moved. And I was like, hmm. So Bell went again. They all sat there and they're all like looking at one another. Because these young officers don't know what to do. They, they have no idea what, what, what do we do. They're all looking at me, you see. So then I've got to then use my authority and my respect that they've given me all these years to get these girls back. Because if not, it could get out of hand at this point. So then I've got to then shout off a balcony, get your... Ah, back into themselves. I'm going to nick every one of you. If you don't, you know me as well as I know you. Then you could see him twitching a bit, do you know? And then I knew I'd got him then, even though I were twitching in wrong areas. But, you know, <laughs> and they started moving. 
So we got them back into their rooms. But just to prove a point, they weren't having these young officers opening the doors again for them to go for more water. And, and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are these, you know, and I'm trying to explain to them, but they're taking Mickey sort of thing. Uh, so that were, uh, that were closest we come there. And that war getting a bit close to bone with that. What was the funniest story from the females? Oh, funny. This was funny. <laughs> we were, <laughs> we had this woman, uh, they called her Pat. Really nice person, but like, you know, she was a bit lacking. And I'd, I'd signed for overtime and I got all worst shifts that I could get. And this particular one, what dinner time, uh, where all officers had all gone to mess and they're all having something to eat and a laugh and, and I'm stuck on wing having to sort out the post for women and write down anything, you know, go look at, you know, anybody who's on suicide watching. Anyway, all of a sudden, I just more or less got to the end of everything and I'm thinking, let me have five minutes. Buzzer. Ah. So I looked on board. It was the furthest cell away, 50 cells away, because there's 100 women on there, I know. Sorry, 25, sorry, because there's up and down. So I walked right to the other end. I opened that light and she went, oh, no, Mr. Graham, I didn't realise you were here today. No. I said, no, I'm, I'm here, Pat, yes, but I'm only here for my dinner, you know, and I'm going to. What's matter, love? She went, well, this is my fault, I know it is, and you're going to laugh at this, but it's my fault. I said, go on then, love. She said, I slept with a window open last night, Mr. Graham. I said, yeah. She went, and a rat came in. I went, a rat came in, yeah. Yeah, but unfortunately I was fast asleep and snoring on my back and this rat went straight down into my belly. She went, look, and she showed me a belly like that. She went, look, can you see it running? And I went, Pat, look, there's no rat, love. She went, no, there is, Mr. Graham, and all I want is a knife. Can you give me a knife and I'll cut this out and get rid of it out at window? And if I'd have given her a knife, she would have, seriously. I went, Pat. Come on, I want you to just get on your bed, love. Let that rat go to sleep. You have a little sleep and I'll get medical care to you. Let them have a little... Oh, right. Oh, lovely, Mr. Graham. Thank you very much. Come on, you. She's like that and she's... I'm like, crikey. And when I'm walking up wing, all girls were laughing, you know. They're all laughing at me for what I'd said to her and, you know, they're telling me I'm a lunatic and all this, like, you know. So funny. She was so funny, that part. But I couldn't... <laughs> You know, I just wanted to chuckle, but I didn't chuttle in front of her because she'd have then took that wrong way. So I was trying to hold it in, but everybody else, I could hear them all chuckling up wing because they can all hear one another through themselves. Were there any other imaginary scenarios like that? Uh, not as good as that one, no, no. Uh, I should imagine imaginary ones is where they're just making lies, you know, really. But um, no, that was the, my favourite one, that while I was there, because that was just unbelievable. I swallowed a rat. And he's running around in my belly, can't you see it? You know. So you had your situation, and then you end up at Wakefield Prison. So several of our guests have been like, Wakefield Prison, Monster Mansion, mm. high-profile serial killers, all yeah. kinds of people, all kinds of crimes. Mm. It really is, it comes across as a unique environment. Mm. So what had you heard about it before you moved over there? Well, I'd had friends who'd worked there. Uh, in years before I even joined service. And they always spoke highly of Wakefield and, you know, they were happy there. They'd done 20 odd year there and everything else. Uh, and at the time there were no jobs at Wakefield, so I couldn't actually put in for it, you know. But I always did want to go to Wakefield. I always thought Wakefield is biggest maximum security in Europe. It's got to be professionally run, you know, because a lot of where I was at uh, Newall, it was not very professional, but... We did a job. We did a good job, really. Most of us did a good job. But there I thought, it's going to be professional. It's going to be, you know, no, it won't. No. They call it Monster Mansion, obviously, because of inmates. Yeah, that's true. It is Monster Mansion. Some of them in the, uh, like when I went there, Governor, when I had my uh, interview with him about moving over, he knew all details in and out, like, obviously. And he said to me, yeah, uh, you're a trained negotiator, aren't you? So I said, yeah. He said, I want you to get up to that effing hospital wing and get that uh, uncle off there. He said, I want him into normal population. He said, we cannot get him off there. He said, he's just taking time and, you know, staff. And so I said, yeah, I'd 
try and like to govern. I went up a couple of times, spoke to him and that, but I said to Governor, ain't going to happen, ain't going to happen. You're not going to get him off. He knew what he was doing. Just for it, background, because some of the viewers, American, et cetera. Yeah. Who's Huntley? Uh, the caretaker from... Ian Huntley. Ian Huntley, yeah, who killed two young girls and tried to burn them in a ditch so there's no evidence. So when you first went to talk to him, does he look like that kind of person or has he got, what kind of aura did he have? He's a, what I'd probably call a little weasel. A weasel? He's a, uh, well, you can tell. He's not a, he's not a, a guy who'd get up there and do a bit of fighting or whatever. Or, you know, he's, a, he's somebody who'd be in background out of way, hiding away. He's not an aggressive person. To be honest, I don't know how he ever got into that situation after speaking to him. And, you know, he, he didn't seem to have that in him. What did he say to you? He just never, never just spoke to me like, a, you know, I oh, you just moved here, boss, and all this, and blah, 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 and, you know, and uh, where have you come from and all this, and, you know, just basic things. But it wasn't as though I could speak to him about his crime and anything like that. We wouldn't do that. But I was trying to get into his head as to why he wouldn't go into population. And he, he just said, no, I'll never go, never, because I'll never return. No, he'll get lynched. Oh, and they're, they're waiting for him, they're waiting for him. You know, he, he's got it to come if he ever goes into that normal population. But what he'd do is he'd try and commit suicide, he'd try and hang his sin, you know, things, anything to keep him up there on the hospital wing. Why were they there, so desperate to get him down there? Well, while he's up there, he's taking, there's uh, more time spent on him one-to-one -one with officers, and the crime is done really is no different to most crimes that have been done by a lot of them in there. So he wants him off there to free up a bed for someone who's probably a lot less firm as him, you know, a bit infirm, so he can get him down there and somebody up there out of the way, an older guy. But no, he won't come out of that room. He won't leave. And I don't know where he is now, whether he's still there, but I bet he's still on the hospital wing if he is. He'll not leave. Were you briefed as to who the other most dangerous prisoners in there were when you went in? Yeah, uh, I met them as well. Uh, Morsley. Morsley. Yeah. Uh, we scary had, we man. had his psychiatrist on here recently, Dr. Bob, and he, he said he did some good work with Morsley. What had you heard about him? And just to explain to people who are not familiar. Well, Morsley was a guy who's, I think he's killed twice while he's been inside. And um, very strange, strange man, very dangerous man. You know, you would not want to be alone with that man, I'll tell you. He would kill you for nothing. But there were him in there and there were... Uh, Isn't he in a glass box, like the Hannibal Lecter cage? No, he into, he's not a glass box, but he's in what they call a prison within a prison. And did you go in there and yeah, did you speak to him? Yeah, on F-wing, yeah. What was it like? He never camp? spoke. He never spoke. When he came out of his cell, because I was like a new officer there at Wakefield, I probably stood out like a sore thumb. And he just stared at me, just stared me in the eyes and just walked past me. I wouldn't speak, but he was a scary chap him. What kind of vibe did you get from his eyes? I got the look of, I'd like to be alone with you. Ooh. Do you know what I mean? I got that look from him like, and I I just looked at him. I didn't, I didn't like back down. I just stared him out as well as he walked past. But I thought, Jesus. I would a bit like, you know what I mean? Is he ever allowed out of his cage or his prison within the prison? I no. want to know what a prison in a prison looks like. It's basically what, as I've just said it, that's how it is. It's um, it's another wing, well, it's called F wing, within inside Wakefield Prison. It's a smaller wing, obviously, than wings that are in there because the wings in there are Victorian wings that come off the spurs, you know. I were on sea wing when I were there. Um, but down there, it's it's like within the prison, but like further away and, and sort of not underground, but it, it, it appears like that, you know, when you walk into it. It's, um, Is what, it true there's a glass uh, box underneath the prison of Wakefield? I never saw it while I was there. No, and no one's ever told me about it. So. What if they've got to take him to medical? Well, that would be a big problem <laughs> because he'd have to be... I don't know what he'd be unlock. I mean, obviously assessments are done at time, but he might be somewhat like seven or eight unlock. Might need a dog with him. I don't know. 
but there'd have to be an SO, seven officers maybe. You know, he, he'd be so dangerous. The guy's, he's a dangerous guy and you can't take him out there. Does he have a shower in his cell then? No, the shower's on, on to, um, unit. So it's just they press a button, he yeah, opens, it comes out and goes back in. That's basically, they're not all out together on association. It's like the one at a time come out, one in, one out. Because they're too dangerous. You know, there ain't enough officers there to control them. Who's and his neighbours in there? Uh, Bronson. He mm -hmm. one there, Charlie. Did you interact with Charlie? I've only spoke to him, you know, but not interacted with him. I've only spoke to him. And he, I don't know, he came over all right to me on that occasion. Like, you know. What did you say to him? I just said, now in Charlie. And he went, all right, boss. What are you doing, boss? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah. uh, he was there with his little dash, you know, and his little glasses. But uh, you, you were like, oh, else, you know, I mean, obviously you get the stories when you're there, people telling you, yeah, it might be all right today, Kev, but you weren't here so-and-so when we had to open him up and he covered him in butter and just wanted to fight with us all. And, you know, because that's how Charlie is. It, you know, people say that he should be allowed out and things like that, but uh, no disrespect to him. I think the chap... He's just been there too long now. He's institutionalised. And I think for to release Charlie now would be a massive mistake because he, he couldn't adapt to this society for one and society would certainly not adapt to him and that would cause a big problem, I think, in my estimation. What about serial killers? Serial, serial killers um, in there. I think his name was um, hmm, Wilson. He would Dennis. Wilson. Would Eric Wilson? Dennis Nielsen. Uh, no, not Nielsen. No, um, I think they call him uh, Eric Wilson. Eric Wilson. Yeah, I think that was his name, Eric Wilson. And he was uh, he was one tasty guy. Him. Oh yeah, he'd done a few, you know. But he was in there on to F wing. Did he look scary? Yeah, but I think out of everybody, Maudsley. He was the one. He was the scariest looking. Yeah. He, he was the one. two people in there. Yeah. He was the one who I'd have give certainly a wide berth to because he, he was type that he wouldn't have no remorse. He was, he's never going to walk, is he? I think at the time I was there at Wakefield, I think there were something like 44 men that had never walked pavements again. So you imagine being one of them. So is that the highest concentration of dangerous prisoners in the UK? Is in it, well, I, in my estimation, yeah, I think it is. Wow. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. You'd, you'd have someone on to escape from there because inside is so secure. You know, you've got your wall on the outside. You've got a fence on the inside. You've got a microwave fence. It's invisible, obviously. You've got officers. A with microwave dogs. fence. What does that yeah. even mean? That's like microwaves, and if you were to cross it, bells are going. You know, so there's an invisible like a beam. There's an invisible fence. Yeah, yeah. There's that as well. But I've got to say this: it went as I notch security as I would have thought it would have been. I thought it would have been a lot stricter run, you know, because uh, I were quite ready for that. But no, it weren't. It weren't that strict run. There were. I think it was something like about. I could be wrong on this day, but I think it was something like ninety two, when we had to stop wearing hats on wings because the the saw it as um, intimidating to prisoners. So they stopped us wearing hats. And don't get me wrong, I think it was a good thing. We what do we want to wear an hat for inside, you know, like that. But there was a guy in Wakefield Prison walking around with his hat on. So I'm watching him walk around landing. So I said to this other chap, why has he got a hat on? Oh, he always wears his hat. So I goes, well, we're not allowed, we can't wear hats. He said, he do not he does. I said, well, if Governor comes at him, Governor sees him every day. I thought, well, why is he allowed to do that? Because if anybody had had any brains, they could have said, oh, I felt so intimidated. You know, my brain's gone, blah, blah, blah. Compensation claim, gone in and out. But they never stopped him. There was a guy there with red dockers on, an officer. I'm like, why has he got red dockers on? When, you know, we all wear black boots and it's a disciplined service. It wasn't as, as controlled as I thought it would be. So if it wasn't as controlled, were there any attempts to test the system by the prisoners while you were there? Yeah, I think there were because um, 
when prisoners come off a wing on the morning or go back on and you know from work or whatever, you can rub down whoever you want. You could sit, have your suspicion, uh, you know, come here, just two minutes. And what I noticed was they'll rub the same people down every morning. So that to me is like, because I've come from security from other prison, I'd be thinking, well, if I wanted to get some off this wing, I wouldn't give it to Sean, I'd give it to Kev because they rub you down every day, but not me. So this big guy was coming off and he looked a little bit to me. So I shouted him off and he said, what do you want? I said, I want to rub you down. Oh, they don't rub me down. I said, well, they might not rub you down, but I want to rub you down, mate. I'm just asking to rub you down. Do you mind putting your arms up? And he didn't want to, you know. And I rubbed him down and he had something in his pocket. He weren't contraband or out, but he weren't telling me that he had it in his pocket. And I just said, well, go put that back in your room. So I thought, well, if he's carrying that, then they could be carrying anything off these wings. But every day they're just doing the same people. I found that bizarre. Did you notice a lot of bent screws there? Well, I, I didn't I didn't have enough time there to pick up on that, I'll be honest with you. But I noticed um, the the people who were there, and especially upper management, they were sort of given information about me from management from the other side. Because they were they were again starting there on me. Was there a bit of a Freemasonic tone to it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It was, I mean, one, this PO were in charge at Wings. I had to go see him and uh, he said, oh, you know, I, I know about what happened, Kevin, and all this, and sorry about it. You know, I don't know, you know. Um, but anyway, you've come back on phase return, haven't you? Yeah. You'll be in a 12-hour shift on Saturday. So I went, no, I can't. Can't do 12 hours straight away. I said, I, I've come back on phase return. I said, come on. I said, I've gone through all this. I said, you know what position I'm in? I said, my head's not in the right place at the moment. He went, uh, what do you mean you can't come? I said, well, I'm back on phase return. Oh, that don't matter here. Don't matter here. So 12 hours on Saturday. I thought, that's another one you say, oh, they got into. And he were, and they called him, his, his nickname, his nickname, uh, Broken Bolt. Broken bollocks or something. Something like that. Yeah, that was his name. And he was, he was, he was a PO, like a, a grade under a governor. But to be honest with you, yeah, I'd agree with that name. What was the first violent incident while you were there, Kevin? I never saw a violent incident while I was there at Wayfield. I didn't see one. Um, I think the, the nearest that came to violence were me uh, before I left. And that was the nearest one that I saw because, as I've just said, Sean, I reiterate again, Information had come over from them to this. And uh, I knew right from getting there that it wasn't going to work. And I'd got enough on getting over this six months that I'd had, you know, of bloody insecurity and what have you. Um, so I knew it weren't going to work. So I thought, personally, I've got to be open here. I've got to be open. I've got to be honest. And I've got to hit it, my feet on ground. So I approached this SO and said to him, look, I said, people are beginning to sort of shun me and everything. He said, yeah. He said, well, you've got epilepsy I'm from New Orleans. And, you know, they're wondering why you're here. And he said, what do you want to do about it, Kevin? I said, look, I said, I've no to hide. I want to be honest. I want to be open. I want to join this community. I want to get on with my life. I don't want to be hiding behind doors and things that, when I've done nothing wrong. So he said, go on then, what do you want? I said, well, when you've done briefing, when we go for the unlock this afternoon, do you mind if I just interact and have a word like, no, no, do it that way if you want. So when he finished his briefing, like, uh, he said, uh, right, Kevin's come from New Hall. He's requested himself. He wants to tell you why, uh, so that we all understand why Kevin's here and welcome him on board. So... I said, right, Kevin, take it away. So I told them all the story. Told them, you know, I've been vindicated. It were all bunkum and all this. They just sat there with faces, just like, bang, straight. And they're just looking at me, you know, and I'm thinking. And I looked at him and he just went, and then this guy just went, right, shall we unlock then? They all got up and just walked out. Just left me stood there. Is it because you're too straight laced that you get shunned? I don't know, honestly. It... it I wish I did know. I'll be quite honest with you. Um, 
I've always been trying to be straight up front. Me, if if I've got a problem, I'll tell you I've got a problem. If I haven't got a problem, then we'll run along and that's it. And on this occasion, this happened, and then I felt like somebody just ripped me inside out. I just felt like, oh my god, I'm no better than some of these in here who've committed horrible crimes and I've done nothing wrong. But I'm stood here in black and white, but nobody believes who I am. Uh, and then the next morning, it really, it really got to me. And the next morning, the guy who said, "Are we all going to unlock?" Then, had like got all these little officers all in a little circle, and I was just stood on my own. And at this point, I'm like getting to the point when I'm just like my head's boiling. And he come out of office to so, and he just said, "Right." Why aren't we talking to Kevin? I know he's new on wing. Why aren't we talking? So this young officer just went, we don't like old officers. Just like that. And at that point, I just thought, that's it. I've lost it. I just went flying over, got into his face, and I just said, right, and I don't like effing young officers, so if you want to bring it on, let's get it on now before we unlock. And then SO come in between us and said, what are you playing at, Kevin? What are you doing at? I said, I'll tell you what I'm playing it. I'm going. I said, I've done. I cannot carry on like this. I've done. I walked off wing. Just walked off. And I came away from there and, uh, well, I don't know. My head was just mashed. Honestly, my head was mashed. Uh, that was severe. It was that severe what they'd done to me. It was, uh, all the way through it. That last two years were a severe beating of your brain. And they were responsible for that. But as I say, Sean, you can never prove it in this country. It might sound like we've got all these rights. It might sound like this government, well, load of monkeys, has, you know, give us all this. No, they haven't. We haven't got them. We haven't got them rights. They're, they're all taken from us, is them. They just look as though we have. I went in front of two tribunals for them. And first one I walked into, I could tell straight away. So as I walked through to her, I was going to know where. So that was thrown out. Then I asked for his evidence. I hope I aren't going over there, Sean. I hope I'm... On board, am I? Am I all right? No, keep am going. Am I all right with this? Yeah, yeah, keep going. Oh, sorry. So I asked for his reasons, his evidence, why he'd found that there was no, um, what they call it, uh, no case to be answered. So he sent me everything over from his chambers at Leeds. And when I read it, he hadn't even read half of evidence. He hadn't read an evidence from an officer who'd signed, saying that she were witness to what had happened. He hadn't read none of that. So then I got back in touch with legal people and said, look, this judge hasn't even read this, so surely now this case should go in my favour. Uh, no, you'll have to go through it again. <sighs> so I had to go through another one in Leeds. And don't get me wrong, the people who I saw, they were a doctor and they were a judge. And they were fair, and they were fair with the questions and everything. But one of the things I put to them was, and at the time the, the same thing would happen to Cliff Richards, where he got accused of this here, which were a load of bunkum. I said, look, there's a guy out there now who's a celebrity and he's going through a similar thing to me, but let's not forget that he can afford barristers. Mm. I can't. I said, and he's won his case. That don't mean I've got to win my case, but I want you to take on board that I can't afford legal. I said, and I want you to look at me favourably like that. I've poured my heart out to you people. I've told you exactly what's happened in my life. So I'd leave it with you now. It took him two days to come to same. No, there's nothing to answer to. Prison service, nothing to answer to. I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do to ever prove this, Sean. You know what I mean? I think if I'd have, if, I, if I'd have had the money like Cliff, I'd have whitewashed him. There'd have been an undisclosed amount paid to me for what happened. Even the, the year in I had at prison, the governor there said it. We're 99% wrong here. We need to compensate you. They compensated me, but what they gave me were pittance to what they should have given me, you know. And, and even that's an admission of and being wrong. But no, that ain't even taken into consideration. It's it's all washed over, you know. And if you like further down pecking order, like I were an officer, not a uh, management, you left. They leave you. They don't want to know you. So all that came about because those two female yep. prisoners. Yep. Decided to fabricate something about you. Correct. I mean, what kind of system would just rely on the word 
of someone who's obviously going to manipulate yeah. the system 24-7 yeah. against your impeccable record? Never been in trouble in my life. Never been in a Doesn't make any sense. Do you, do you think that someone high up just had it in for you and wanted to get you out? Yeah. And that's the, what I'm more, and this is where the incident, what they can't see, what I'm just going to relate to you now. I didn't know about this sexual allegation and I were on nights. Now, on nights in a prison, the um, acting SO, well, sorry, the acting governor, who's like an SO, but the, the acting governor has the keys to the outer gates. The security man has the only key in that prison to cells. Right. So I'm the security man. So I've got the key to any cell in that prison. Now, I'm not aware about this sexual uh, allegation until on the Wednesday morning, a friend of mine who was an SO, bless you, she pulled me and she said, Kevin, I haven't said this, but you've been investigated. I said, what for? Sexual assault on so-and-so on this wing. I said, you are having a laugh. She said, no, she said, it's been up in morning meeting, but she ain't going to suspend you until after your nights because she's no one else to do nights. So she's going to keep you on. So think on, I've gone, what, four days now, walking past this girl's door with only key in jail, hanging on my belt. Now, if she'd have had half a brain, she could have got her friends around her to say, right, we're going to kick off at middle at night and say, Mr. Graham entered my room, you heard me screaming, blah de blah we've got him. And they would have had me bangs to rights there. No cameras on them wings there. No cameras. Had me bangs to rights. I'd have been locked up for something I'd never, ever done. Now, when I brought this incident up, that I, why weren't I removed from that wing, perhaps put on another wing, or removed altogether from prison and said, look, I've been... This has been an allegation. We're going to have to take you off duty. Blah de blah. Fine. But no. They left me walking past their room all night long with that only key. But it's, they couldn't see an incident there. It does sound like it's come from someone higher up. That's right. The number one. The number one governor. She had it in for me. Why? Well, it, it went back to a joint POA um, as a rep, you know, and she didn't like that. She didn't like POA. She didn't want me to be part of POA. And when I did, that's when she, her attitude started to change with me. And so just to clarify for people, that's the Prison Officers Association. Association is that a union? Yeah. Union. Is it? Yeah. Union. And she didn't. She didn't like that at all. Uh, and then things happened, which were a bit well should never have happened because. The infidelity in just in the lower ranks, in the upper ranks as well, and she were part of that, which I knew about. Didn't like that because I knew about that. And her boss, her chap who she was having the inappropriate relations with, he then were my gaffer. So then he started putting pressure on me. I couldn't get out of that system. I couldn't get up the ladder. I'd passed all my exams. I'd done everything. I'd done tool manager's job for four years. And I took it over from a lad who they were like, oh, you'll never fill his shoes, you know. 92% uh, he got it to in audits. I got it up to 99 or 98, and it would have been 100, but the PO should have signed the book when he went into this department, never signed it. So the auditors picked up on that, and knocked two points off. So... He tried to say I had no management skills. He wouldn't advance me to an SO. But before all this came out, he were quite happy to advance me to an SO. But as soon as all this came out, that you know, about knowing things that I shouldn't have known about and also the allegation that I didn't know about, he knocked me back on it. And when I asked him, he said, no management skills. So just to clarify then, one of the things you knew about, you somehow you'd ascertained that she was having an affair with a male staff member. Yeah. And how would that, how would you ascertain that? Well, it, it started to become common knowledge because when she was younger, 
hot in her earlier days of prison service, she were a PO at Wakefield Prison. And she met him there. And uh, it were going on from there, really, intermittently. And then when he joined us at Newall, on circumstances that were, well, uh, he'd been allegedly having an affair with someone over at Ascombe Grange, he was shipped over to us and he was told that he couldn't even put him for promotion. He was a he were governor grade, but he couldn't put him for a promotion further up the governor grade uh, for, I think it was six months. He'd only been with us about two months and become deputy governor. So that tells you another story, <laughs> you know. Uh, so he become deputy governor. How, how he got around that with prison service, I don't know. How that would have manipulated, but he did. And he was just, um, he was just somebody who, it was what I'd call a smiling assassin, you know. He he'd really got it in for me in, in a big way, and I didn't realise until I had finished in service that he were having uh, searches done uh, in gate, trying to catch me out. Because I noticed on a couple of occasions that when they'd searched me, they finished searching. And I thought, it seems strange that, you know. But I thought, oh, maybe that's just time up, you know. They've had a... But now looking back, I think it were all geared on to me. You know, never ever found anything on me because I never took anything in. But I think that were another one they tried to trip me up on. You know. So when you were ousted, what was your mental health like? Oh, terrible. Shocking. I've got to be honest with you on that. Um, I still I still see a psychologist, um, Dr. Burnside. What year, what year was it you were ousted? Uh, 2008. And you're still seeing a psychologist Still now. see him now. Wow. And I've got to say this, I'm in a lot better place now than I've ever been. Good. Um, but at the time... I've got to admit it, Sean. At the time, I just, I'd lost it. I'd lo and I'd never, ever in my life ever been like that. But I just lost it. I just couldn't comprehend what was happening with things. I just could not get my head around things. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd go off on a tangent with people, or, you know, just something, nothing. But like now, I've got it all back under control. I'm, I'm fine now, like. Were your family worried about you back then? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a time when, you know, I'd lost my mum and she was a big piece. But I'd lost her. And uh, I had to keep it all together, you know. Uh, uh, if you had to win for my wife, I don't know. I don't know. Because it was, it was, they'd push me that far. It screwed me down that far, you know. I don't think I can even put it into words how far these people had screwed me my head up. Um, but it was hard. It was really hard. But I've, I've come out of the side of it and, you know, uh, due respect to people who's been there for me and been as right as rain. But as I've always said, you might never have done anything wrong in your life, but as soon as people start throwing that about, it'll stick. And it has done with me on, on some people who just use stupid things like that and talk about things like that that never happened. I don't know how they'd ever feel if it happened to them, you know, but it, it's happened to me, you know. And I've lost a lot of friends with it, yeah. Do you think doing the podcast and the book has helped your situation? Yeah, um, the book, um, I felt like at the time I had a, a big back operation I've got four titanium bolts in my back, but I couldn't walk about. I couldn't. I couldn't get about. You know, my back had broken in two, and I said to wife, "I, I don't know what to do. I'm. I feel like I'm just lazy sat here." And so I started writing, and it was like how I was growing up because I had an hard upbringing. You know, I brought up in a uh, there were four of us in family, but I was youngest, so I always knocked about and smacked about and thing. You know, and I took a lot of you know hard beating. Um, so it was hard, but I thought, no, I'm going to write it all down. I'm going to document it all. But then I started getting so far in, then I wanted to get into where my life had gone, where I'd gone to, what had happened in prison service. I was documenting everything and everything is in there. I don't know how I've remembered 
<laughs> most of it. I'll be quite honest. My friend will say to me, how do you remember these? Because I've had two strokes as well. Yeah, I've suffered two strokes. But um, now I've done it. And I, I felt like I've, I've, I've released a lot from me. You know, I've let it all go now. I've let it out there. I were holding a lot in, you know, protecting myself with a lot of it. And I've just let it all go. And I think podcast, it's a great pleasure to come and meet you for a oh, start. You too, Kevin. Great pleasure. Yeah. Um, but I feel that by being here, I'm now letting it all go. And I'm telling people out there, it's in that book. I've, I've poured my life into that book. You know, it's, it's concealed between them pages like a big jam sandwich, <laughs> you know, but it's in there. Like, and that's how I feel. I just feel that this has helped. Psychology has definitely helped. And the book has. And when can people look forward to the book? The book, hopefully, will be out before Christmas. It should be within the next couple of weeks, actually. It's going uh, live on Amazon. And you've got quite a funny story surrounding the name. Yeah, the name, yeah, the name. <laughs> yeah, the name. Uh, Sparrow in the Sausage, yeah. Uh, it would have, uh, when I was a young lad, I'd be about 14. And um, at that time, life was hard at that time. My mum and dad had just split up after 25 years. My brothers were in Navy. My sister were married. So I was on my own with my dad. He took me on. And I had to get some work to get some money. I was 14. And I managed to get paper round, my little rounder. But then this job came up at a butcher's. And I thought, oh, that's a good job, you know. So my friend got me in with him and I went there. <laughs> we were making pies and sausages. And unfortunately, a sparrow flew into the room at the time. I tried my best to get this damn sparrow out of the room, but unfortunately it panicked and it went straight through the grinder. So I'm sorry for anybody who's listening to that, but I did try. Uh, but we couldn't do anything with the meat. At the time we were young lads and we were innocent and we, we didn't want to look idiots, so it had to be baked. And it went into the pies. <laughs> <laughs> and the butcher who owned the shop, he came in and, complimented us how much work we'd done <laughs> and he baked the pies and when they were baked they looked beautiful when they come out of the oven but I weren't trying one of them he did try one mm. and he said these pies are beautiful lads well done you've done the right job so my friend being my friend as in them days he said I bet they'll fly off shelves these are Miss Elsie <laughs> <laughs> and obviously I saw a funny side to that with burden you know um. so yeah that's the that's the reason behind the title the sparrow uh, in the sausage, and that's the that's the um, the cop out there. But it was a funny thing, but not a funny thing for the sparrow. And I apologise to you, little sparrow. <laughs> well, huge thank you, Kevin. And thank if you. you've watched this and enjoyed it, let us know in the comments. Kevin's links for his book, etc., will be in the description box below the video on the YouTube version. And you're just such a fantastic storyteller. I mean, we've sat here gripped for two hours and it's um, on the edge of our seats and we just wish you all the best <laughs> with the book and everything. Thank you very much. It's been, a, yeah. it's been an absolute sensation to visit here. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Give us a hug then. Okay. I wish, sorry, prison service would have been as nice. Oh, <laughs> lovely, to meet you. lovely to meet you, darling. If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a thousand people now and we selected 10 of the hardest hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests. Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino Crime Family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink McDonald, £6 million bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, international smuggler's Thai death row prison escape, John Abbott, San Quentin prison shootout and escape, Michael Francis, Colombo crime family capo portrayed in Goodfellas, and Wildman, English enforcer in Arizona prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023 so check that out as well it will be available worldwide on amazon thank you for listening cheers